Welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab Public Lecture Series. Today we're presenting a talk by Don Danby called Living Infrastructures, Reworlding Urban Environments. It's presented as part of our co-creation studios worlding workshop, which is a partnership with Unity Technologies. Worlding is a first of its kind research and incubator um, uh, that explores climate futures at the intersection of land use planning, documentary, and um, speculative fiction, as well as game engine technologies. Five teams have been working uh, for a week um, together online, uh, and uh, we've been met with um, 46 guest advisors from the MIT Unity uh, communities, as well as people from all around the world. My name is Kat Cizek, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Co-Creation Studio. I'm a white Gen X woman with brown hair and a big smile. Today, I'm in Tecoronto, dish with one spoon territory. I'm going to pass this over to our uh, partner, uh, Marina Saros at Unity Technologies, who, uh, who is the Head of uh, Sustainability at Unity, and will introduce our guest speaker. Welcome, Marina. Thank you so much, Kat. Um, before I welcome Dawn, I first wanted to just give a quick um, thank you to everyone who's joined us today and also a thank you to you and Srishi as we wrap up a completely amazing workshop that's been taking place over uh, a week now uh, with the teams who are probably almost as exhausted as <laughs> you and Srishi are for all of the work that's gone into thinking through and designing how we would spend our time together over this past week and how we can support creators who are working at this amazing intersection of storytelling, placemaking, climate change, design, and documentary. And I actually cannot think of a more appropriate or wonderful way to end the week than by hearing from Dawn Danby. Um, I originally encountered her work at Unity about uh, maybe two years ago. And um, I, I actually joined Unity because I was very excited about the technology stack that we have and the opportunities that we have to address climate change through our technology. And the first time I heard Dan speak, uh, Dawn speak, I realized that she really got it and she was already doing it. Um, her work is a huge inspiration to me as a fellow Californian. Um, she is the co-founder of Spherical, which is an integrative design, research, and technology studio. And for two decades, she has been working to investigate how technology can support and repair Earth's living systems. Her work is, as I mentioned, a huge inspiration to me, and I think that she'll be a huge inspiration to everyone who's joined us today. So thank you so much, Dawn, for being here, and over to you. Thank you so much, Marina. Um, so psyched to hear, be here with all of you. Give me one second while we start. Okay. So the question that I'm coming uh, today with is, is it possible to transform the paradigm of infrastructure? Can anything that, we, that could, be, could anything be done that is commensurate with the existential risk of climate change? So I've been invited to come to speak to you about worlding because in many ways it's the central theme of Spherical, which is the creative research studio that I co-founded um, and so today I'm beaming in from Wichin, uh, Chichenyo speaking Ohlone territory, otherwise known as West Oakland or the Lower Bottoms on the West Coast um, and uh, the West Coast of North America. I come from uh, the Great Lakes and, um, and from not far from where Kat is calling in from today. And so, to, you know, five years ago, um, we started Spherical uh, to explore the potential of, of digital tools for enchanting and regenerating the living world. And one of our early projects actually was called Reworlding the Art of Living Systems. We curated an experiential space research lab in collaboration with the Gray Area Foundation for the Arts in San Francisco. We brought in 12 artists and technologists to expand perceptions of our living planet, really doing a set of explorations based on um, the science of, of Gaian systems. And the result of that was The End of You, which was a month-long immersive exhibition which concluded 
just days before the first COVID lockdowns in March of 2020. So for that, for that project, we welcomed thousands of people into an old San Francisco theater to explore the scales and dynamics and patterns and relations of Guyan systems. And so we had multiple ins installations and the exhibit invited participants to expand and dissolve their sense of self into the consortium of our planetary life web. And little did we know that this would perform a kind of artistic incantation at the time. We didn't expect uh, that this would be in some curious way, anticipating the weirdness of the collective isolation and novel entanglements that were catalyzed by the pandemic. So, you know, what you're seeing here is there's a, an animation, uh, excuse me, an, an installation that, um, that we did with other artists uh, that was a meditation really inviting people to listen in to the voice of the incorporation, the, the voices of the non-human microbial worlds across scales, <laughs> and uh, which seemed very like an interesting provocation in February of 2020, um, only to have a sense of horror looking back like a month later that there we all were lying on the ground, breathing the same air, uh, not wearing masks. My own interest in reworlding goes back a few decades. I made a deal with some trees. Um, so this is a, an image of a tweener version of myself uh, taken by my dad in the Carmana Valley in British Columbia, which at the time was a highly contested uh, area um, under threat of, uh, of clear cut logging. Um, the atmospheric concentration at that time was 380 parts per million. Uh, today it's north of 415. 416, 417, we need to check, like you check the weather. Um, but I was raised in Canada as a colonial subject of the Queen of England, really living in the echo of empire. So even as a tweener kind of environmentalist, I had a feeling that things were up but and wanted to change them, but didn't really have language for it or a, or a deeper kind of historical context for what I was in. So, I mean, paradoxically, my parents who raised me in this really intense colonial context, um, really, I mean, seriously, I was, I was raised to, to eat dinner with the queen if, if such a circumstance might come up. Um, but they also took me onto um, these, illegal, like illegally took me into these logging roads to see the so-called crown lands. Um, and at that point, that was a, really a, a point of change in myself where I really started to work on seeking to change the paradigm from within the paradigm. Um, as we, I didn't go back to that place until 25 years later. This is a few years ago when I revisited with my daughter. This is the road into that uh, that same grove of trees. Um, and you know, in the intervening years, uh, much of life has been going away, right? And, and what I mean by that is that it is simplifying. So we're experiencing at a planetary scale, highly sophisticated ecosystems being extinguished. And that's also the reason that there's so much critical attention paid to climate, but it's not just about heat. It's about the effect that the destabilization of ecosystems has um, on life. So, you know, I, as, a, as a bit of context, I went into design and I went and worked uh, initially in industrial design, in architecture. I went down to Austin, Texas to try to learn from kind of the key thinkers who were working on integrative design um, in architecture and landscape architecture and really committed my life to working on ecological design, went back to Canada, um, worked with an artist there called Noel Harding, who was a kind of a well-known uh, celebrated eco artist. And we were doing also work, really trying to work in the landscape to try to figure out how do you like hack the urban landscape? This is like, these are like renderings in Maya from 20 years ago, um, trying to figure out how do we use visualization technologies to actually begin to understand how to bring more life back, uh, back to the landscape or to landscapes that had been um, really paved over and, and decimated in many ways. And so some years later, long story short, I ended up working with the tool builders. So I spent several years working deeply with technology in service of sustainability at Autodesk, um, who are a software company that develops largely 3D uh, software for the industries for the professions of engineering and architecture and design um, and the built environment in general, right? So a lot of what we talk about when we mean sustainability in that context is around how do we use 
resources or so-called resources, materials, energy, um, and to some degree water. And, you know, I mean, my motivation for doing that work was the belief that digital tools can determine decisions in the physical world, right? If you can use the right sorts of analytical capacities. And as we all know, you know, working in this space, the boundaries between virtual world building and actual world building had begun to blur. And so I got very involved in looking at how, how tools, this is a very old picture, this is like 15 years old or uh, 12 years old, but um, how you could use tools to analyze the energy in buildings. Because, you know, infrastructure is commonly understood as the technical armature of civilization. It's something that requires investment and maintenance. And we're thinking about how do we make these things in a very different way. And that that's the definition of of sustainability in a lot of these, these contexts. So I worked on a lot of different things. I studied the chemistry of materials and products, the ecological effects of manufacturing. Um, a lot of this work was around how to hold back the tide of extraction. And I will say that, that you know, with our hearts wide open, many of us believe if we create the tools for limiting that damage, it would save the life systems being lost, right? So, the struggle that I had with that is that the, the story of that and even the ecological science that underpins that assumption is incomplete and the efforts are so incommensurate and the culture is so self-congratulatory that I found myself adrift. I somewhat lost my will, you know, because there are real issues with the belief of using technology um, to accelerate decisions and thinking that that will lead to a healthier living system on the planet because you know for example if you want to build a road or, or bridge it's easy right now i mean it's easier than ever you know if you've been trained to pave the world in concrete i promise you can now pave it faster you can automate you can optimize that paving right you can do this um cheaper and more efficiently so to speak um and so you know, while on one hand, paradoxically, design and visualization technology has the potential to radically reduce materials and energy use, it can also be used as an accelerant for outda outdated ways of working and building. So I did a lot of this, this stuff and I kind of, uh, there's aspects of it that I absolutely stand by, right? I was doing a ton of education, particularly with, uh, with engineers and designers to introduce certain types of ideas and I want to be clear, it's not that the work of reducing um, or really being smart about how we use materials, energy, extracted resources, all of that is absolutely critical, but it can be a totalizing view that um, that is incomplete. And I mean, in a lot of ways, I felt that the work that I was doing had become entirely blind to life and to living systems. And so I realized that the, the worldview underlying these industrial tools um, didn't consider the deep context, right? That the places where, where things were made, the living systems that support those places, the people that are involved in that, the sources of the materials or their destinations. And so like most dominant worldviews, they are invisible to the people that hold them. And I myself, Found myself, found myself kind of in that unstable feeling of, whole, of, of trying to advocate for a perspective that I no longer held. <laughs> and, you know, in some ways I can make, you can make things worse <laughs> uh, by gesturing at improvements while perpetuating a destructive system. So, you know, I, I bailed from the corporate industrial paradigm. We co-founded Spherical uh, for me to, you know, I, I felt like we were starting it and I was starting it to begin to unwind all of this and also to start to see where the potential really was. So I'll pause to say, you know, having been born a colonial subject, I have to work really hard to unlearn the use of the royal we when describing humans and human activities. I aim to speak only for myself, but much of what I'm sharing comes from a deep collaboration with my team at Spherical and our fellow travelers, and above all, my partner and Spherical co-founder, Dr. David McConville. So where did all of this, <laughs> this thinking and this perspective come from? What is the worldview underlying contemporary industrial infrastructure? This is a, a complex topic, so I'll enter into it through a story. So let's talk for a minute about paradigms. 
To make sense of things, humans make worlds in our minds, with our actions, and through our cultures. So for countless generations, our ancestors tracked the pat patterns of celestial and terrestrial events to anticipate and align with the cycles of life. Harvesting food, following an animal migrations, all of these were central to survival. So in other words, our species' very survival has depended on developing tools of collective imagination to sustain relationships to places. And there were, there were cultures that built empires on power and they dreamt of gods that ruled the world. And they imagined these gods as holding the cosmos in the palm of their hands. And this eventually gave birth to a, a radical new vision where God was transformed into a rational architect constructing the world from the outside. And it was believed that only the human intellect could com comprehend his mind and intentions. And it was from this transcendent perspective of a God's eye view that the totalizing notions of cosmos and universe first appeared. So you've got kind of a combination of power and rationality, right? You can kind of see here the, 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 uh, the imagery that came, you know, came through in the um, 13th century and, and later around like the image of the, of the God looking down and, and controlling things from the outside. It's like it's a very sticky idea <laughs> and an approach to, to control and domination. And so European monarchies were based on the, on the notion that existence is a continuum. It's just defined by a strict hierarchy known as the great chain of being. So both God and kings were at the top of this cosmic social order, right? And if you then descend down from royal heaven, you can start to see angels and then humans, then animals, then plants, then minerals, and finally hell at the center of the earth. And you've got women actually below horses because you couldn't live without a good horse. And this paradigm of domination and supremacy is still used to justify the dominion of over, over all things by some privileged human beings. And this worldview is manifest in colonial infrastructure. Right, so what we're looking at here is Roman aqueducts, right? So these are thousands of years old, um, but that worldview embodied control and domination and the mindset of empire. So aqueducts sluiced waters, water to places of privilege and away from nourishing landscapes. Roads accelerated access to remote lands, facilitating exploitation and control of people and resources. And even as empires become increasingly secular, the imperial approach continues today. So the economy becomes the new God, whose followers also believed it could transcend the constraints of the living world. We're looking at the, uh, the second Los Angeles aqueduct cascade. Um, so this is water that is carried um, long distances across, across California and down into Los Angeles. Colonizers have, colonizers have treated indigenous homelands as sacrifice zones, stealing their, stealing their minerals, trees, water, and people for those who could afford it. And now, you know, under the auspices of flood control, engineers have sought to control once wild rivers and they paved the beds and drained the waters. So instead of meandering and nourishing their riparian zones, urban street rivers and streams are transformed into concrete channels. So some classic, you know, if any of you have seen Terminator or any of these other films set in, uh, in LA, you're, you may be familiar with the Los Angeles River. And this quest for control has expanded to a planetary scale, right? So colonial anthropocentric paradigm of infrastructure is spread across the lands and waters of the earth. So you've got roads and tunnels and bridges that accelerate movement and access, at least for some. Walls and fences enclose what was a perhaps once vibrant commons, uh, cables and pipelines transport the data and fuel and all of this to coordinate and feed seemingly an insatiable economic appetites, no matter what the cost. But the cascading consequences can no longer be hidden. The cost of this colonial infrastructure has been the destabilization of planetary climate. So ironically, this understanding, our understanding of this is reinforced by the insights afforded by this same infrastructure. So the infrastructure itself is informing us of what is happening. Um, right now, right? We have got, we have the technology now to be able to see ourselves. So let's talk about scales. 
and the insights that, that had to do with, with uh, previously imperceptible uh, scales of phenomena. This is the first photo of Earth from a satellite in orbit. This was made possible by fossil fuels. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1959. Um, it shows a sunlit area of the central Pacific Ocean and its cloud cover. And this is from the Explorer 6 satellite, which was part of the space program that would radically transform perceptions of, of Earth, of this home planet. The Explorer mission first discovered that the Earth's magnetic field protects our planet from, from solar radiation. So the so-called magnetosphere is literally a force field. Without it, Earth's atmosphere and, and oceans would be blown away. Uh, and this was the first space age insight to begin illuminating Earth's planetary infrastructure. It should be noted that Mars does not have a very good magnetic field. Um, a few years later, after, uh, after some of those initial shots were taken, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory hired inventor James Lovelock to build instruments that could detect life on Mars for the planned Viking mission. And Lovelock suggested that instead of sending a probe to Mars, life could actually be detected remotely. By photographing and analyzing wavelengths that can't be seen by the naked eye, he devised a way to study the chemistry of Mars's atmosphere remotely. Right? So he discovered that Mars's atmosphere was in a state of very high entropy, while Earth's was quite the opposite. Right? It was dynamic. It was alive. So Lovelock reasoned that if living systems were present on a planet, that they could create a self-regulating atmosphere. So in other words, life functioned like a thermostat at a planetary scale. And he called this the Gaia hypothesis. And this was named after the Greek goddess of the Earth. Um, and, uh, you know, very like beautiful, uh, lyrical title. <laughs> and, and, you know, in some ways, part of the reason that, that people often think of, of, this, of the, the science of Gaia as being not serious. However, a few years later, Lovelock teamed up with the microbi microbiologist Lynn Margulis, who filled out the rest of this story. So Lovelock was an engineer, right? And he saw all of these processes very mechanically. But Margulis understood that life processes were far more complex and mysterious than a machine. She was really working, and we could talk about Margulis for hours, um, just an amazing character, but she was working to really understand what were the origins of life on Earth. And so had a very deep, um, deep understanding of, um, of that the collective respiration and the collective cycling of life you know, from the, from the microbes to the megafauna was key to Earth's atmospheric and climatic stability over time. So she even eventually proposed that all life is entangled and she strongly challenged Darwinian's, uh, Darwinian and neo-Darwinian dar dogmatic beliefs about survival of the fittest. She showed that complex life forms emerge through symbiosis, that, they, that they're joining, learning from, and depending on other, other species. And so the first popular pu publication of the Gaia hypothesis showed up in 1975, and you can see the, the, the theory um, on the cover. So the top image is subtitled Earth's Atmosphere at Present. It shows the many atmospheric gases dynamically maintained by living systems, right? There on the upper right. Um, and the bottom image, which is subtitled The Present Atmosphere Were Life Deleted, shows the atmosphere in a maximum entropy state, okay? So they proposed, uh, Lovelock and Margulis, that aspects of the atmospheric gases and surface rocks and water are regulated by the growth, death, metabolism, and other activities of living organisms. So the article, which is called The Atmosphere Circulatory System of the Biosphere, postulated that Earth's atmosphere necessarily co-evolved with life on the planet. In short, if life didn't exist on Earth, we wouldn't have an atmosphere that supports life. So in this view, the atmosphere is not a thing, it's a dynamic, dynamic process and an ongoing product of evolution. And so Lovelock and Margulis would go on to assert that life has regulated Earth's at temperature and that without it, Earth would, would in fact be significantly hotter, maybe even up to 20, 25% hotter. Um, so what you're looking at is the habitable zone, which is the area around a star where you can have liquid water and you kind of have to have a particular is often called the Goldilocks zone, have access to a particular temperature variation. Um, 
And they suggested that in, in some ways, Earth's living systems have, have enabled it to actually have access to that Goldilocks zone even more so because the life systems are cooling the planet. So as life is killed off, Earth gets hotter. In other words, life creates the conditions for life. As a fun fact, since we are talking about gaming and gaming technologies, the Gaia hypothesis was the motivation for Will Wright's 1990 game, Sim Earth, uh, for which Lovelock was a scientific advisor. But today we have an extensive network of Earth observing satellites that have further expanded our view of the living planet. And they provide increasingly dynamic views of previously invisible relationships. So these are eyes in the sky that help bring previously invisible data and phenomena into our perception. So you can see across huge scales of space and time and frequency and relationality and relationships that form Earth's living infrastructure. And you know, now we can see exchanges that are the primary currency of our home planet. What you're seeing here is the global flows of diverse species of, phy of phytoplankton. These provide the, the base of the marine food web. They're crucial elements of Earth's carbon cycle. They provide up to two thirds of the world's, world's oxygen through photosynthesis. Um, as they move, <laughs> um, as their conditions shift, all, move life's with, all life moves with it. And we can now see how ocean currents dis distribute solar energy to regulate Earth's climate. In addition to the breathing biosphere, Earth, the climate is also regulated by cold air and surface waters moving toward the equator, warm air and water moving toward the poles. The circulation of the oceans also stabilizes planetary temperatures. So while the conveyor belt uh, stabilizes Europe's temperature, the melting gl glaciers in Greenland are threatening to shut it down. And so, and similarly, it was recently discovered that the Amazon acts as a biotic pump, right? Often talk about, people talk, often talk about the Amazon in terms of it being a significant carbon sink, that is true, but it is also the fact that the evapor, evapotranspiration of forests pump moisture into the sky, regulating local and global water cycles. So what you may have seen a second ago is you can start to see how the water uh, coming off of the Amazon starts to move up and um, and that that water is coming up it's like a huge rivers in the sky that are generated by the forests themselves. And the tropical moisture feeds the water cycle over the Atlantic Ocean, which then forms into atmospheric rivers in the sky, so you can actually start to see the dynamics of how. You've got biotic pumps in the Amazon, you've got water moving into the Pacific Ocean, and that ha actually affects rains on the west coast of North America. If you shut down the biotic pumps in, Am in the Amazon, it affects the ability for people to grow food in California. Um, and that actually has a significant destabilizing effect on the food systems of, uh, for fresh foods for the rest of North America. So these are just a few examples that point to the most profound revelation of the space age, which is that Earth is alive. Um, paradoxically, right, while new technologies are, uh, have been have enabled us to visualize Earth's complex living infrastructures, they are at the same time helping to radically destabilize them, right? So does it hardly needs to be said, extractive technologies have been reducing the complexities of the living systems across soils and oceans and forests. So I think the question we're asking is if dams and aqueducts are infrastructure, then what is rain? What are rivers? If windmills are infrastructure, what is wind? If shipping lanes are infrastructure, what is the food web? Right, like climate change is about CO2, and it's also about far more than CO2 in the atmosphere. It's about how to manage land, how to work with soil, right? And it's, these, are the, these are the living infrastructures of the planet. These Gaian systems are, are the substrate and the living infrastructures of this earth. Which brings us to the importance of relations. So to state something obvious that's rarely made explicit, the global climate is an aggregate of local climates, right? That these microclimates emerge from highly localized sets of conditions, particularly geographic features and vegetation types 
They're mapped out here as biomes, but microclimates can and are transformed by human activity, right? So for the past five years, our studio has been asking ourselves, is it possible for humans to heal and regenerate microclimates? And the good news is that we found hundreds of examples demonstrating the potential of human agency. Uh, these are projects that are stabilizing and healing their places, regenerating their landscapes and strengthening their communities. And this, this project came about this sort of curatorial effort to bring together um, what's now almost 400 uh, short documentary films um, about people in places, regenerating those places, came about because of a question that people were asking, um, which was like, what do you mean by a regenerative project? What is that? What is that? You know, and, you, and we could spend however long sitting here uh, churning through words, but as always, <laughs> it's, it's much more effective to actually show examples, and there are many. And one of the things, um, you know, that they, they are all unbelievably unique, and yet they all involve people in places collaborating with life in diverse ways. They're doing that by building soil in farms and grasslands. They're doing that through planting trees, through growing food, through recovering mangroves. Um, almost all of them involve contending with the flows of water, sometimes slowing it down so it can be held in the landscape. Because when you hold the water in the landscape, you're able to create conditions for more life to thrive, right? So these, each of these is incredibly, that none of them will, will scale in the way that um, that sometimes people think about trying to take an idea and have it spread across the entire world. There is no single silver bullet. That is the beauty of this. But all of these show that working for a diversity of life isn't just sentimental, right? It's not like just functional. It's, it, there's a, there are deeper um, social and cultural dynamics at work here as well and that, that, are, that can be celebrated. And you know these projects have now entered the science fiction imaginary um, in Kim Stanley Robinson's latest book. <laughs> he, we were actually we we had the the surprise of opening it up and um, and seeing chapter eighty five uh, built entirely on the map key of of the uh, the map that you just saw, where he sequentially lists these projects, gives voice to each of them. Um, as examples of future projects initiated by the Ministry of the Future. So this is a, a fiction book. And um, although there's no indication in the book, none of the projects that are listed <laughs> are fiction. They're all real examples of how people across the world are stabilizing and healing Earth's living infrastructures. So today we're exploring the potential of microclimate regeneration in California. This is a recent production that we were working on, um, visualizing the big picture context of how water use in Los Angeles County affects watersheds across the West. So you can start to see all of the different watersheds that, uh, that Los Angeles County draws from. Um, and a lot of that is, is also to help the people in the region understand where their, where their water is coming from. So we're experimenting with ways of visualizing the cascading effects um, and impacts of decisions in LA, right? Which is an incredibly diverse place. It, it contains cooler tree covered places, as well as others, uh, including waterways, as, I, as you saw earlier, that have been heavily paved. It's a place that contends with fires and floods and moving earth, events all made more uneven and extreme by a destabilized global climate. And, you know, it pumps in water from great distances, but, uh, but doesn't yet effectively catch the rain when it does come. Like so many things, there's, this was done with good intention, right? This was done with the intention of, of, um, of protecting the communities from floods, but the effect 100 years later um, or 100 plus years later is now that a lot of that beautiful fresh water that falls from the sky is lost. And so the question is how to work with, um, with people and to support Angelinos in seeing the potential of how these places could evolve to be healthier and greener. Because this process almost always involves capturing and holding rainwater in the land, whether it's underground, whether it's in catchments, whether it's in living things such as trees and soils. This process of healing natural water flows and greening landscapes um, almost always involves humans who plant and water and maintain and tend. Right. So our vision is a transformed Los Angeles that cools its own microclimates 
through a shared process of tending and care. So we have to ask ourselves, because we're now working with communities, it's no longer conceptual, how might people, others begin to see and even understand a watershed? You know, this is where we're trying to figure out how do, what do you use, how do you use gaming technologies, VFX technologies to be able to show um, processes that are implicit or sometimes hidden, right? How might people in a community begin to get a felt sense of the interactions? And how might that, uh, that set of understandings begin to cultivate different ways of thinking about places? How might it provide opportunities for power and agency, which is another big question we're holding, is how can, um, can people in communities who have had decisions made for them, right, on the, by these centralized systems of control, you've got, um, you know, agencies and engineers and, and uh, people who are really, in many ways, trying to keep the population safe um, through reducing risk. But how might you actually bring in the voices of communities in an effective way when the ideas around, um, around and, the, and the knowledge of how to actually transform landscapes is so, uh, so technical and so specialized? And we're also asking, like, what's the role of filmmaking and storytelling, mapping, software tools, gaming engines, all of these things for creating enchanting new stories? So here we're just experimenting with some of what we talked about earlier with the, the biotic pump, like how does the, uh, the biotic pumps evapotranspiration regulate water cycles? And so, because as, as I mentioned earlier that the, um, a tree, this is like looking at a, a live oak tree in, um, in Southern California can do so many things, including hold vast quantities of water underground, function like stacks and stacks of air conditioners, uh, provide shade. I mean, it's the classic example of the, of the multi-beneficial effort of you plant one thing and it, and it provides all these many, many, many different um, ecosystem functions as well. But there's so many questions, right? Um, we're asking ourselves like, as I said before, like how to co-design living infrastructure with communities and how to do so with integrity. Um, because you know, even a plan view or a map is encoded with technical shorthand. Um, and this was really, this was a huge revelation to me years ago when I was working um, in the Rust Belt in Ontario and, and all of a sudden having to take you know, designs and renderings and present them as options to a community and realizing that uh, for the first time, because I'd been trained as a designer and so I could read different views of things and understood how to interpret them, um, I didn't understand the extent to which this was invisible to many folks, that there's actually a, you create a separation or a, um, and that, that separation of being able to show certain kinds of technical visualizations um, can also be weaponized in so many ways. You can use it, you can use that capacity to be able to control people by, because they don't understand what they're saying yes to. Um, and so there's a, a deep set of questions that we're trying to, to answer around um, how to create visions that are accessible and, um, and how to contend with the practical dynamics of politics and justice and accessibility, and the openness of data and the importance of privacy. Right, because I mean, you know, in some of the experiments, and we can talk more about this, but some of the experience, experiments that we were doing using um, game engines and using real-time visualization are, uh, you know, they, they, they work in certain contexts, but they don't work in contexts where everybody in the community only has access to a flip phone, right? And where, where are the ways, where, what's the dance that we, can, that we can dance, whereby you can use, um, visualizations like this as a way of perceiving potential, um, but aren't uh, but aren't necessarily limiting it yourself, self-limiting ourselves to things being real time or really pushing the boundaries of the technology itself. Because in, in our case, we're having to push the boundaries of, our, of accessibility and access. And we're seeking to, to support and build on decades of efforts to reworld urban environments under the auspices of green and blue infrastructure. So this is in contradistinction to gray infrastructure, 
um, which is often what we think about when you look at at, um, at the built environment, anything kind of concrete and steel and uh, and based on on machinery and um, often has a form of, of centralized control systems. So these terms of green and blue infrastructure are used to describe living systems that create habitat and they provide shade, they clean and capture water and sequester carbon. And these strategies are increasingly recognized as critical for mitigating many cascading of impacts of climate change, including increasing extremes of flooding and heat and drought. Okay. And these are often called nature based solutions and there's these strategies are being wholly embraced by many municipalities and think tanks and corporations um, seeking to monetize so called ecosystem services and th there's much to say about that I mean there's finally we're, we're starting to have um, have this dialogue about the importance of let's call like nature <laughs> as urban infrastructure. Um, but you know we're also i'm also experiencing the fact that as these things happen and as they evolve they are immediately uh financialized <laughs> and um and in the worst case used as a uh, as a attempt to balance some kind of worse extraction happening elsewhere right so when but when we look at those kinds of of so-called nature-based solutions, and we isolate them from socioeconomic context, these purported solutions can also perpetuate and even exacerbate inequity within cities, right? So this title of, of this recent New York Times article says it all, since when have trees existed only for rich Americans? And what you can see is, um, and we see this in many, many places, the differential of, of tree cover um, in, uh, in some communities that are wealthier, within the same metropolitan area, um, that the wealthier communities have higher tree cover than, uh, than, the, than the lower income communities, and therefore they, uh, they have far less heat stress um, and temperature stress than, than areas where, uh, where trees have been limited uh, or cut down. And so many, many cities, right, and many, many cities, especially in the, in, the, in the United States, are still dealing with the extreme inequity created by racist and discriminatory, discriminatory, discriminatory uh, policies of redlining. Um, so certain neighborhoods were classified as hazardous to investment. So access to finance, like mortgages and other services, were withheld from people who live there frequently, um, historically people of color. And so, yes, um, you know, too often trees in poor neighborhoods were cut down, exacerbating urban heat island um, effects. And so what you actually see is that areas that were redlined also have, um, have the effect of, of dealing with uh, significant heat as well. So these practices resulted in microclimate inequity. In LA County, you've got temperatures that can already vary by 20 degrees Fahrenheit between inland areas and the coast. And, Certainly, some of this heat has to do with elevation, right, or proximity to the coast, and, and those those kinds of considerations. Um, but some of it just has to do with concrete, right? I mean, this is just weeks ago in Los Angeles, um, and and you know, looking at the 128 degree asphalt in schools, um, in school playgrounds that are hugely paved. LA County is not a homogenous desert, it never was. Uh, historically, it had diverse ecosystems that ranged from coastal wetlands to upland chaparral, right? And it's also the most populous county in the US. It has 10 million people spread out across nine watersheds and carved into 88 municipalities. So it's a highly complex um, and an unbelievably diverse place um, that functions more like a city state than anywhere else in the US. Um, but it's also it also means that there's huge amounts of different types of, um, of of interventions that there is no you know just just as there is no one size fits all for regenerative projects around the world that is also the case even in in, in this particular defined uh, and much smaller region. Our primary collaborator in this work is Andy Lipkis who you see down there in the um, with the. Um, with a tool planting the tree uh, on the right. Um, and Andy co-founded co the nonprofit Tree People over 50 years ago. And for decades, he's been helping lead efforts in urban forestry and watershed health. 
But he found out long ago that simply planting trees is never enough. They must be grown and tended, right? So he has lots of stories about over, you know, and many, many chances of, <laughs> for having ex experiments over many years where by working with community members and actually even having them do really small acts of ritual where they would, you know, take a piece of their hair and plant that hair with the trees so that their DNA was intermingled with the DNA of the trees or having everyone hold hands around in a circle around the tree as it was planted. Those acts increased the likelihood that people would then have a relationship with that tree and be willing to tend to it through its particularly delicate early years, right? Because, you know, just the, the way it is with, with dealing with, um, with initially with small trees, you have to actually tend to them, especially the first couple of years of life. And that having these mass tree planting campaigns often leads to mass tree die off camp, um, efforts. And so that question of how to cultivate care with communities, how to find ways of integrating humans into the living infrastructure becomes the key question, the key kind of constraint and requirement for how, um, how infrastructure is, is created and tended to. So how can living infrastructures be co-designed with communities and co-tended with communities over time? Um, particularly when, when, when people are, uh, are destabilized in their communities or when things like infrastructure are, are thought of as something that someone else thinks about or deals with. You know, climate change requires radically transforming the outdated view of static infrastructure. Uh, human societies embedded within and depended upon vast webs of relations that permeate human and more than human worlds. So engaging with these nested scales of living infrastructures, this can expand the dominant narratives of climate solutions, we think, right? So it's not just about renewable energy and carbon drawdown, both of which are extremely important. But if we limit, or excuse me, if we, <laughs> if, if, the, uh, if the solution set, if the set of responses is limited to things that only relate to energy and carbon, Right. If, you, if we are optimizing only for those things, then that is what we will get. <laughs> and, um, and, and we and it is, it's very possible to su to succeed wildly um, in a decarbonization effort, um, in an emissions reduction effort, that if these other considerations of how to look at the life web, how to tend to the water cycles and how to engage and unfold communities in that work, then, then much of that other, um, that other, those other efforts will not be as nearly as successful. Really to heal microclimates, humans over the world must rehydrate landscapes, strengthen communities, reestablish right relations with the more than human world. And there's abundant ancient and contemporary models that demonstrate how to cultivate reciprocity with the living earth. Lots to draw from. And I think there brings up lots of questions about how we take those ideas and tell those stories and make those, those ideas and, and potentials available and accessible. Because you know, it's always surprising, we can talk all day about how, how to create incredible photorealistic expressions and visualizations. But you know, when, my, when she was five, my daughter drew this picture of the hydrological cycle. And, uh, and there was something in her that got it. I don't even remember how, <laughs> but, there's much to learn from, uh, from her understanding of the invisible energy and water flows. How did she hold those in her mind? How do any of us hold any of this in our mind um, and then begin to share those stories with others? Thank you very much. I look forward to talking with you more. Thank you. Thank you, Don, uh, for this remarkable talk. I, I can't think of anyone else um, when Marina suggested uh, that uh, we, we ask you to do this talk. Um, we had spoken briefly, but now seeing the talk, you are 
living and breathing and working at the very center of this Venn diagram that we've all been exploring and are, are doing in our work with land use planning, with infrastructure, with climate futurism, with design, with speculative fiction, documentary realism, um, and above all, co-creation. Um, at our studio, we, we, we really consider co-creation within communities across disciplines and with non-human systems. And um, you have moved through all these and woven um, them together. Um, and for me, most of all, uh, really holding both the pragmatics of it, but also the poetics in such delicate and beautiful ways. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to invite our panelists uh, to join us. Um, these are the teams of Worlding, and I'm going to pass over to my colleague and partner in Worlding, Srishti Kamat, the producer of Worlding and former, um, uh, gra well, gra graduate now of the CMSW program at uh, MIT. So Srishti, could you tell us a little bit about our teams as they open their videos and um, unmute to, to begin this conversation? Absolutely. Thank you, Kat. Um, as the teams start their videos, I'm just going to read one sentence of each and I will request each team to maybe share which, what team they're from. So state your name and then what team you're from so the audience knows. Um, so Waves of Buffalo is an Indigenous-led land-based site-specific installation that seeks to envision a future where once again the great herds of buffalo walk freely. Following Indigenous story knowledge, the buffalo's impact reaches above ground, on the ground, and below the ground. Second, we have Year 2180 Brazil, which is a project that addresses current and future issues relating to flooding, availability of portable water, energy, and the celebration of culture through ancestral knowledge, stories, and rituals that create meaning and help us understand who we are and what we can become. Seabreeze Bop City is a cross-university community and place-based project that focuses on addressing land use and land rights issues that stem from systemic racial inequalities amid climate change. 100th Meridian is a project that unpacks the hardships and conflicting interests brought on by the longest running drought in the United States by following people who are working the land as they come to terms with dwindling sources of water in three essential river basins in the American West. And then finally, through a co-creation gaming project, Wild Natures will examine ideas of what is natural, who belongs where, and how these decisions are made for humans and non-humans from the point of view of young people who have been let down by the mainstream education system in the Northwest of England. Um, you can find a lot of this information and more on our website. So if you go to cocreationstudio.mit.edu slash worlding, and I'll drop it in the chat, you can read more about these projects. And with that, I'll invite our incredible teams to ask questions. Please do share what, what team you're on, just so, just so people know. Thank you. Thanks, and I'll invite also the general audience to drop your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them towards the end of this, uh, this conversation. We'll start with Marie Ev. Thank you so much, Dawn. It's really a beautiful presentation of really articulating the earth, science and climate together to really not only be carbon neutral, but equity, the question of equitable and also be nature positive. My question to you is a question of scale and you're in the envisioning of the future. You explored that how important it is to be local, but while remembering the global at the same time, because we're part of this earth system. And for a lot of people, they have a hard time like living and articulating in multiple scales of their own life. And that's a relation that land use and relation with climate, it's a global and local. So can you, how do we do storytelling to technology that embrace those, what I call Russian dolls of scales that we live and breathe every day? So part of those climate earth systems and be more nature positive on our impact on the world. Yeah, thank you, Maria. I think uh, the, the, the question of working at uh, with scales um, that are accessible and understandable to community members is a really significant one for us all the time. And I sometimes um, often think one of the things that we that we often talk about is the dynamic of having attempted over now decades to communicate the um, the, the planetary climate crisis as, from a planetary scale only, which is a really which is not, it's not that to say that the science isn't true. It's just a question of communication and accessibility. I think that um, that there is no immediate felt sense of any positive effort that one might take 
right? It's always kind of couched in terms of like, well, if you can, if you can swap out, you know, particularly your energy systems or whatever, that may have an aggregate effect on global climate, as opposed to what are the things that you might be able to do within your own community that could, in fact, change the sensible heat in your immediate uh, environment. And so I think there's a it's sort of that question of, of even like, what, how do you get people enthusiastic and excited about working on climatic issues when it all is thought talked about at a scale that most people can't hold in their heads. And so you're, you're asking, I think, a deeper question around how do you move between those scales, right? How do you allow, how do you help people interpolate between the, the, the local to the global, which isn't I, I don't have an answer for that. This is a question we're asking. This is part of why we, we jump around on scales and do transcalar storytelling. My, my partner, David McConville, did that for years, kind of going, okay, how do we talk about bioregional um, climates by looking at the cosmos all the way down? And you can take people on those journeys. But uh, at the moment where, where we're really landing is like, let's just set aside the planetary narrative and really talk about what can be done in the immediate local scale because it is in fact changeable within a human lifetime um within you know within 10 years you know you can significantly change the amount of heat that um that is experienced in a particular place it's a paradox vanessa Hi, Dawn. Thank you so much for your presentation. I really loved it. I'm with Year 2180. Um, I'm also the author of 2100, A Dystopian Utopia, The City After Climate Change. And I feel like I am so on the same page with you in terms of cities and what we're trying to do um, to create a new way of living on the earth. Some of the things that you said that I thought were really interesting were the economy has become the new god. Um, I think that that's really true. And I think that that holds the whole not just carbon, but our whole way of being on this planet is the problem that we have a very short period of time to fix. Um, when you talked about Earth's system is self-regulating and the atmosphere is a living system and that life creates the conditions for life, I really loved that. I really also was very interested, I wanted to ask you more about what we can do at the local level because I was very intrigued by those case studies of the change in microclimates. And I was wondering if um, you know, if there's any, I don't know, like, again, data information on, you know, on the impacts of that. And I'm wondering, like, you know, how many, and I, again, this is a little bit of a silly question, but I don't, I don't think we necessarily need to do like top down only. I think we've been focused on like, it's a big problem. So we're looking to the UN, but maybe we just need, you know, we also need in the meanwhile, while we're waiting for that to happen, we also need a lot of community gardens and a lot of action on the local level. And so I guess the question is, how much of that do we need to reach a critical mass? Like what, how can we understand how to scale that and how much of an impact it has? Oh, all the all the big all the big questions and the paradoxes. But I think, you know, what, what I'll start with, I think, is that uh, a lot of the way that climate action has been presented to individuals and to households and community members is usually through consumption choices, right? And again, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be like reductionist about this. I, I think that that is, all, that is all reasonable, but it's, it's a very bizarre way of actually trying to address um, engagement with local places. And I think that's, that's the key thing is like, how to support and engage people in, in communities and how that's done is totally different based on where they are. We happen to be working in Los Angeles and Los Angeles County, which is a place where, you know, over we're, 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 drop, we're stepping into the river as, this, as the river is moving, right? We're there with people who've been working for decades on, um, and we're there to support the, their ongoing work. And there's, you know, countless small organizations who've been advocating for many different things from environmental justice organizations and, uh, and looking at tree planting and all the things. And a lot of the aggregate for them is that they've now passed significant bond measures for community infrastructure. So a lot of the work that we're doing is in fact helping communities apply for that, those funds. And so that's, there's, it's almost like the little bit of the interstitial space where the, the smallest scale is at the household and there are people who have the privilege of owning homes and can make decisions and they may have extra excess funds to, to, to make decisions on those homes. 
But the next scale up is really what can people at a block or a neighborhood do to be able to bring public money into those places. And um, I think, you know, it is a real question. I think someone mentioned in the notes, like, you know, um, does there, does that money come from taxpayers? Yeah, it sure does. Um, and the and the voters, you know, passed it and said, here's three hundred million dollars a year that, to go to water infrastructure in Los Angeles County, and now communities have to apply for that. So in a lot of ways, that's the that's the effort that we're uh, that we're helping support, right? And again, uh, I want to underline. Also, we also pay when there's a disaster, right? After the fact, pay more. But we could pay now before the fact and not have the disaster. You got it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Chris. Uh, thank you, Don. That was, that was a great presentation and a, and a really inspiring use of data and, and simulation in storytelling. I think uh, a lot of us uh, in, in, in this group are, are, are looking for the, that kind of uh, facility, looking to add that kind of facility to our projects. And I, I'm speaking from the, the Seabreeze group. Um, but one thing that I've been uh, really inspired by this week uh, with my cohort is is the um, the the range of interdisciplinary uh, collaborators on all these projects. You know, we have traditional filmmakers, we have Buffalo experts, we have local collaborators, and I think these um, this this range of perspectives really helps to 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 tell these stories. Um, so al along with the the um, really compelling uh, database storytelling. I, I was wondering about how, how you find uh, your collaborators to help you tell this story and how do you uh, initiate uh, those kinds of collaborators into this type of storytelling when they you know, might come from outside of, of this kind of uh, technically enabled space? Oh, I mean, diversity of perspectives and backgrounds is super important and I mean a lot of the people that we have working with us at spherical um, on our team are just hybrid people you know they are they are um, UX designer naturalists <laughs> or you know bird expert um, concept artists you know that, that almost everyone kind of has that um, has that kind of hybridity um, but we always have, you know, a, a crew of people that we call on as well. So I'll just note that, that, you know, there's, there's so much that we have to draw from in terms of specialized understanding of landscape architecture, of, of engineering, hydrological models. Like there's just a, there's a world of, of folks that, um, that we need to bring in and, uh, and that we try to, to bring along. I think that it's actually an interesting question around how do you initiate people into it? Because sometimes the best is if they don't know. Uh, you know, we, we were working with a wonderful um, filmmaker uh, called John Pavlos on our team, who is just has as his background, like he, he was not, he's an amazing science communicator, but not somebody who had been immersed in a lot of the particular aspects of science and climate that we were working on. And so, in fact, his lack of knowledge about it when we met him allowed us to then figure out, oh, like those are the blind spots. Those are the, what are the things that when he got it, we we're like, that's what we need to share. That's the thing that we're so immersed in it, we don't know, but you need to kind of bring in other like nifty people who are come from different places. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's the story, right? Um, so, I mean, that's that's kind of what I'm thinking about. How do, how do you initiate people into it? Um, but, you know, we're all, like, like I say, everyone kind of stepping into the river and we're trying to pick up um, pick up where we can and, uh, and learn from learn from others all the time. I hope that answered your question. Jason. Hi, Don. Thanks so much for that. I'm part of uh, Waves of Buffalo. Um, and I think it's building off of Chris's question. Um, I'm, gonna be, I'm wondering if you have any wayfinders or guides or experience in terms of a place like Los Angeles where there's been such historical erasure of the indigenous history and the knowledge that exists in the land um, and how a project like this in a place like Los Angeles can really sort of make those connections again to what's still there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the only way to do it is to is to forge those community connections with the indigenous communities there, which we've we started to do with organizations 
um, like tree people in LA who actually have those those as codified part of their of their work. Um, you know, there's so much um, around the historical ecology, the place names of, of Los Angeles, the history of um, what's now called Los Angeles. That um, I mean, as as you say, it's 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 like <laughs> it's it's almost um, one of the best examples of of colonial erasure um, as written on the land. And so, trying to unwind that and understand what's uh, what's inside it um, is. Is a, is a real serious ongoing effort. I will say just on uh, to that to that point as, as just a separate reference, not something that we created, but there's an amazing children's television show um, on Netflix. Um, it was created by a woman called Elizabeth Ito called City of Ghosts. And there's a, an amazing, um, one of the episodes is called Tamangar. And it's just incredible telling of, um, of LA through the lens of, uh, of the indigenous people, but it's created for children. And so, I mean, I say it's created for children, but like, I want to watch it over and over. <laughs> it's so good. But as a way of, of, um, of revealing different forms of relationality in the landscape um, through the voices of, of, um, of the people there, you know, that's that we hold that in the highest as the highest bar, I think, for from the perspective of how to how to make these worldviews accessible and understandable. Um, you know, we aspire, I think, is the, is the answer, Jason. We're trying to we're trying to do it in a good way. But we're, you know, in a lot of ways, we're just starting. Ash. Hi, Don. I'm Ash uh, from Seabreeze Bob City Project. Um, I have a question and a kind of, I guess, more of a comment, and they're kind of very different, but I'll just put them both together. And um, so one is uh, when you were talking about um, this notion of perhaps optimizing for the wrong things. One of the things that comes to mind for me, especially when we are dealing with data systems, you know, thinking about efficiency, predictability, all of these things that we perhaps are making design choices on. Are there examples from spherical where you might, where you have these blind spots or where you might have been uh, like, oh, well, we're looking at the data like this. What, what are we not measuring for? What, what is, what is, what is, um, you know, what are the things that we're, we're not uh, taking into consideration? Or what if we, we, we look at like this instead of, the, uh, instead of, you know, thinking about predictability? So I guess like, has that occurred and, and where, it, where has it occurred? Um, and then the other is just a comment more, I guess, about, I love the image of the tending to the tree as um, a way to get people to kind of tend and care with living infrastructure. And it made me think about um, examples from architecture where buildings are built and then communities through ritual or um, festival end up having to maintain the, these kind of on a regular basis. And just, just thinking about the notion of, and questioning just more, you know, how, do, how is it possible to create new rituals and um, festivals around these uh, sorts of tending maintenance care moments? You know, just going back from that that statement, I think it's so it's so on point. <laughs> it's like because we, we keep talking about all of this as, as if it, as if infrastructure is this physical thing that you put away and then we can walk away and not think about it, which is like you know maybe in some ways the design intent. It's very paternalistic, right? But the um, the opportunity to and the invitation to get involved in how infrastructure or how living systems around us work requires really different cultural questions and cultural rituals and um which makes this a you know in some ways some much harder thing right to really do it right because i think you're you're asking exactly the right question what um about how it is that that humans and community members are engaged in tending to their own places their homes their buildings their collective infrastructures um and there's not an easy answer as to how that's done. I think, you know, the example of Andy Lipkiss and, and others is, is just what people have tried over time. And, um, and what are the different kinds of things that they've, they've, um, they've worked on to, 
thinking about your question of blind spots oh my goodness there's so many <laughs> you know like the, i think um, my partner david mcconville talked often about how when he was doing like scientific storytelling that you'd kind of take like you know huge vast quantities of data and then you'd probably to actually communicate to the public or engage people you had to just pick like a small percentage of that just enough to tell the story um because we all get, you know, people get overwhelmed with looking at too much data, too many data layers. Like here, I built you a giant GIS interface. <laughs> and you're like, I can't, I can't infer anything from this. And so I think that's where the art of, of pulling on the threads of what's the, what's the, how's the story of the one person going to help any of us understand the story of the, of the whole thing. Um, before I move on, I did want to mention, because it just because it got my head going, uh, Jason had asked a question about um, other things that were going on. And I, I did want to mention the fact that, uh, that there are really remarkable Indigenous collaborators in LA County who are actively hosting um, webinars about water as allyship trainings that we've been um, attending. And so there's some really remarkable things. I'm happy to share some of that after the fact as well. And there's just like incredible documentary work. <laughs> I mean, like, LA, I always forget what, you know, there's, al there's almost like too much to know because it's one of the most studied and mediated places in the world. Um, any thought that we have has already been thought by a zillion different people in a paper somewhere. Um, there's so much beautiful documentary work around water in California. The aqueduct between us is a really good one. Any more questions from the group? Um, hello, thank you so much. Um, lot, lots of things to think about. And I love the idea of living infrastructures. Um, I was wondering, um, when you do stuff with collaborators and um, you find groups that you want to work with who've already been doing stuff, and I love that you feel that you're stepping into um, an ongoing work to amplify that and um, I, I'm wondering um, not it's just generally like um, around this work around climate um, if you have to make decisions about who you want to work with uh, and how that reaches for um, people who would be in opposition to what you're trying to do. So like climate deniers or just um, like, uh, like if you're talking about colonial histories or indigenous past who are against that kind of thinking. So like the ones who, um, like I know you have to decide like who you're gonna, who you wanna work with. I'm just wondering if you, think about that or how you think about how much resource you want to allocate to bringing someone over from mm -hmm. the other side and how much you have to decide that's the cutoff point to say okay we're not going to deal with like the anti-vaxxers just as an example sure no i mean it's a huge it's a huge question and i think i, I will say for for us you know at the moment um we're not undertaking a huge effort, like a public, you know, big public campaign to try to reach everybody and try to have everything resonate. We're, we are working with, um, with select groups of people who have been doing this work for a while. And so we're not currently putting a lot of energy into the question of how to contend with like the most crazy perspectives on, on you know, it's, I think that in some respects, the more practical, concerns that we have to work with have to do with people's um practices like how is how is engineering practice usually done who makes decisions who holds power and um and to what extent do does community dialogue and engagement or people asking for what they want uh start to s threaten those dynamics and i think that's that's a you know in some in some respects the bigger the bigger tension um the other stuff is always there you know, there's there's always an, there's always um, 
dynamics of, of having to deal with climate denialists. I actually feel like I'm dealing far less with climate denialists these days and more um, climate nihilists is really kind of, I think there was a quick, quick move there where people were like, it's not happening. And like, now there's nothing we can do and it's over and let's just, you know, let's just burn it down. So <laughs> that's, that's a lot more the, the, the energy that, um, that I think that we, we in this case being um, myself and our, and our, my collaborators have to contend with from time to time. Um, can go, we can, I could talk more about that, but I think not giving a lot of, um, not giving a lot of food and water to those other perspectives is, um, and not really putting a lot of energy into trying to contend with them because then you kind of drop down into their, then they're, then, then those dialogues are controlling the narrative. And we're in fact trying to kind of step back and say, actually, you know, what we're advocating for, um, here are all the different benefits and we're not trying to financialize all of it. Um, although some of it can be financialized if it needs to be. And sometimes you need to, to, to kind of play that, uh, that, that rhetorical maneuver of turning things into numbers. Um, but, but like finding, you know, I think there's always the question of how do you kind of like set aside the politics? What's the story that you can tell that everyone can kind of go, well, that's actually what's happening. Like what's the most common sense way and, and reasonable way of, of, um, of contending with it. Thank you, Don. I see you, Hawk and Marina, and we'll get to you in a second, but this ties well to uh, Greg Udelman, who asks a question from the audience. Uh, first of all, Don, uh, incredibly inspiring work and perspectives. What leverage points, if any, do you see for accelerating the integration of these perspectives by decision makers in policy and business networks? So I guess, you know, the, the stakeholders, um, the decision makers as your audience, can you talk just a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, and in a lot of ways, um... It's been a joy to sort of step away from having the having kind of centralized decision makers be the the primary audience or, or key leverage point. Um, but some of the visualizations that you saw were actually intended for those audiences. That's um, where it was really about how can we very quickly help uh, understand particular dynamics of what's what's happening in, in the landscape and then what the opportunities are. And I do think that um, there's nothing that we can do that hasn't, you know, to some degree been done. I mean, the models of and the, anal the, the analytics and the reports on how, for example, in Los Angeles, um, the landscape might be can transformed and cooled. Um, there are whole institutes <laughs> that work on these things, whole labs at universities. And so they are, you know, very, very active in these policy conversations. And I think that that's starting to have an effect, you know, I mean, part of what we're starting to see um, are, are changes in, for instance, I can't even remember the specifics, but um, you know, when, I, when I showed the image of the, um, of the incredible heat islands created by schoolyards, right? That, I mean, it's bananas. <laughs> it's just like, that's a whole other thing. We can get into that alone and it would be insane. Like the amount of, of heat generated by asphalt, which is places where kids are supposed to be playing, um, which actually take up a huge amount of, of urban space. And so there's, it's crazy on all the, all the levels. And, um, and that is something where there's an opportunity for policy to step in and start to shift it. And that has actually begun to shift. And so I think that, um, you know, how do you push at those questions is, is, is an ever present thing. I mean, I, I tend to kind of come back to the Diane de Prima notion of like, you gotta, we have to be pushing at it from all sides. Um, all different techniques will work. You're gonna run the analytical numbers and then you're gonna create the beautiful story. Um, you're gonna bring out the grassroots crew and you're gonna take the board of supervisors person that you that your cousin knows out for lunch. Like there's all of those things um, are different ways of, of moving systems. And I think I, I don't, there is no simple answer to it. Hawk, I think you've had your hand up. Yeah. Um... <laughs> First of all, thank you, Don. Um, my name is Hawk Storm of the Scattaco Peoples in New York. I'm with the uh, uh, 2180 project. And uh, I wanted to touch on how we're looking at, you know, community and as a whole, uh, whether we're looking at community as just a bunch of people or are we looking at community as, a, as, um, as being part of the ecosystem, and, you know, people are being are human but we're also animals and we we live with the trees and the and the other animals and the vegetation and um and how when when we do replant and when we do 
re, um, reforest and, and obviously weather patterns have shifted uh, due to deforestation um, and droughts uh, have been created because of this and because of the uh, destructive practices and the way that we live on our planet. And, and so um, then we worry about water and where we're gonna get our water. But if we replant and if we <clears throat> uh, work with our environment and, and uh, you know, you had mentioned in the rainforest uh, or in, in these heavily forested systems, how uh, they move water and not just on the ground, like they, the, the evaporative, uh, the way that the water evaporates from the trees creates clouds, creates storms, creates water in those environments. And so when we plant, the initial planting might take some water, but in the end, we're creating these new weather patterns and bringing the water back to the areas that need, need the water. If we're like in Brazil with the deforestation, you can see where the, where the farmers have uh, done slash and burn practices and, and now they're bringing in cattle and it's turning into desert right next to the, the Amazon rainforest, right? And so if we replant the, and, and the water's moving away as, as we're doing it. So if we replant those areas, the water will come back with the storm systems and the weather patterns uh, in the opposite way of way, the way that we've been destroying it. So um, just so uh, to bring into context, if we're looking at cities like New York or LA or something like that, and we turn them into more green cities, when I say green cities, not just with the energy, but with the buildings, growing plants and, and bringing in uh, trees into, into open spaces and, and that'll knock down the temperature and also bring water with it and bring more rain patterns with it. And so I just wanted to, I don't know if that was a question or just a uh, grateful that you that you brought that into the conversation with your presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to add. So thank you. No, I think you've just elaborated on it beautifully. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a question. I mean, you're, everything you're, you're speaking to uh, is completely, uh, completely resonant. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Huck and Dawn. Marina. Uh, do we have time? I do have a question, but I don't want to, uh, I know that we have. Time for one more question. Haha, -ha, I get the last question. Yay for me. Um, I actually had a follow up to the piece about engagement um, and who your collaborators are. So um, you're working at such an interesting space amongst a whole bunch of different players. You know, I know the California context of this decision making. Um, and I'm wondering who you see as your collaborators. Are you positioned more as a um, like expert consultant to some of the design firms or the you know planning officials, or are you facilitating um, knowledge transfer to community groups? Like who? It's it's such a complex area, and I'm wondering where you see your like unique superpowers playing. Sure. Out. Thank you, Marina. We're trying a lot of different things, um, but I would say that right now. Um, the, the thing that we're that we're experimenting with and and really right, trying to work on is um, is just first of all to acknowledge that we are not um, we are not an organization that's been doing uh, community based work in um, in these communities uh, for the last decades right so we cannot uh, we have no we have no voice in those spaces we have no um, we have no right to to come in and and really uh, provide anything other than support and tools and assist in um, in the in the narratives and the and the and the ways that, that community groups are already working with their uh, with the people around them. So that's that's kind of where we are relationally to it. Um, you know, while we do have people on um, now on our team who actually come from the community, who actually who can who can be the interface, even though to those community leaders, uh, they are not trying to be the community leaders. It would just be um, yeah, we could say more about that, but it wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, the the thing the thing that's most um, that I think the, the the role that we play uh, is uniquely to certainly provide. I mean, we're, we have a software development team. We're building um, interactive tools uh, for community engagement and dialogue, um, and and we're constantly in the in 
that's that's really a question of co-design of working with community groups to say okay what is it that you need for these engagements that would help you begin to advocate for certain types of changes in the community and advocate for for resources because what it comes down to is them bringing resources into their community and how much knowledge do they need how much of it of um context setting right and and how do we uh, assist them with that without having it be a requirement that uh, that anybody be involved in some massive seminar about about green infrastructure um, technologies and um, best management practices and all the different um, hyper hyper specialized aspects of that so it's this is a question i mean I'm, we don't have an answer for this we are trying this right now but that's that's kind of where we sit in the system is is very much in a support role to um, to the communities that that um, or to the organizations that that have been working inside their communities for many many years. Thank you. Thank you so much. And sadly, we are out of time. Thank you, Don Danby, for this incredible, inspiring talk. Such a wonderful way to close out our worlding worlding workshop and in initiative. Thank you to all the teams for being here and asking questions and being part of this conversation. Thanks to Marina Psaros for the wonderful collaboration with Unity. Um, this has been mind blowing for all of us. Um, and I wanna also thank um, our, our sponsors, our funders. Uh, this lecture series would not be possible without MacArthur Foundation, as well as Just Films at Ford Foundation. And I want to invite you all to join us for our next talk, which is on November the 1st, where we celebrate um, our book coming out. It drops on that day called Collective Wisdom, Co-Creating Media for Equity and Justice. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.